Glad to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm thankful for your church. Uh, so thankful for uh, pastors Jeremy and Chris that uh, have been a joy to me for many years. We've had a lot of sweet fellowship together, and they they've been a great encouragement to me. And I'm thankful to be able to join with you today, uh, having prayed for you often and uh, doing that with gratitude to the Lord. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, or you can see printed in your worship folder uh, the text that we want to consider today in this first letter of, of Peter. Join with me as we pray for a moment. Holy Father, we thank you that by the greatness of your mercy and grace, you have allowed us together and you have given us your word that inspired that authoritative, that infallible word. And you have given us your Holy Spirit to dwell not just among us, but in us. And as we've gathered today in the name of Jesus, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is present to teach us and instruct us. We need you this morning. We desperately need you to work in our lives. And so we pray for grace and help, strength in the sufficiency that is bound up in Jesus Christ to be made known to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 17, 1 Peter chapter 1. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who believe, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is God's word and may he write it on our hearts uh, as we worship him through the proclamation of his word this morning. What do you think about God? Or to put it another way, what kind of thoughts do you have about God? Well, one may think that God is good and loving and God is just and merciful and God is holy, and all of those are absolutely correct. But we can think those thoughts about him and still not know him. What we think about God does not disclose necessarily the inner workings of our hearts. We can think lots of right things about God and still be far from him. So let's narrow that question down a little further. What are your thoughts toward God? Or to phrase it differently, what is your disposition toward God? Or to use the language of Jonathan Edwards, that great 18th century uh, preacher in New England, what are your affections toward God? So we're looking at thoughts toward God, our disposition toward God, our affections toward God. And we could do a poll on the street. We could ask uh, people what they thought about God, and they might give a lot of correct biblical answers. I've had those conversations, and perhaps many of you have as well, where people identify certain characteristics and attributes of God if you ask them to describe it. And those are correct as far as they reflect the revelation of Holy Scripture. But those correct statements tell us nothing about their souls and their spiritual condition. It's only as we consider the disposition of the heart, the affection of our hearts toward God, that we know if a person has really been redeemed through the Lord Jesus Christ and brought into a living relationship with the Lord God. One source said that uh, the disposition is an attitude of mind especially one that favors one alternative over others. Now, that's just a secular dictionary. No theological language in that. 
But I think it's helpful because what happens is the disposition, the affection of one who believes the gospel of the Lord Jesus and trusts in him as Lord and Savior, now indwelled by the Holy Spirit, though that disposition, those affections are different than what they were before Jesus Christ saved them. And while the heart is inclined to follow one's own desires in the way of the world, when Christ meets us in saving power, those inward inclinations, those inward desires, those inward dispositions changed. We're now disposed toward God with attitudes of reverence and faith and hope. You see, Jesus' redemptive work applied to us changes our disposition toward God, and it gives evidence that we really do know him. Now, how does Jesus' saving work affect our dispositions, our affections toward God? How do we know that our disposition focuses on the living God? That's what I want us to think about as we consider this text. Now, you may very well be aware that when the scripture was written, there were no such things as chapters and verses to break things down and make it so easy for us to study and memorize and think on. Instead, this was just one big letter uh, that was written to people that were scattered over a large area of what is modern day Turkey, now uh, anciently called Asia Minor. And this first chapter that we consider is deeply rooted in the triune God's work in the gospel. And so we see uh, Peter opening up and talking about the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus to bring us into a life of gospel obedience. And this same triune God, in verses 3 to 5, this same God causes us to be born again through Jesus' death and resurrection and he preserves us in that relationship to him by the sealing work of the Holy Spirit. We see that in verses three through five. Now, interestingly, in this letter, you would think that Peter would just start bombarding them with a bunch of commands. He gives four commands in this first chapter. And each of the commands is rooted in the work of Christ for us. And this is so critical that we see this because this makes the difference between being miserable legalists as Christians and walking in the joy of the Lord. And so what we find in these four commands are four dispositions, hope, holiness, fear, and loving one another. And all of these give demonstrative evidence that we belong to the Lord because these affections were worked into our life by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. They're, they're not things that we can conjure up. You know, I'm going to try really, really hard and see if I can fear the Lord. Well, we can, we can have some kind of aberrant idea of that, but we're not really going to fear the Lord in the way Peter is talking about, apart from the work of Christ. When he changes us, he changes the way that we live towards God as well as the way we live towards others. And that's what we see first in a warning against presumption in redemption. Now, there's a distinctive pattern in 1 Peter as well as the rest of the New Testament. The Lord doesn't just toss out commands and say, okay, you're on your own. You gotta get this done. I'm counting on you. Work your hardest. Do your best. Instead, what we see is that he roots his commands in his work. I mean, th think about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. We're, we're familiar with the Ten Commandments. But the very first statement before the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, who redeemed you from Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Do you see that connection? There's first redemptive relationship. Then God says, now walk in obedience. And that's the pattern that we see throughout the New Testament. Uh, for instance, earlier in this, uh, this first chapter, 
We're told to fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then a little bit later, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. But when we look at these commands, we see they're set in a foundation of God's saving work in our lives. In other words, he's saying, you can now fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus because of that redemptive work of Christ. And you can, because God has given grace, you can be holy also yourselves in all your behavior because the Holy One is living in you. And it's interesting that part of what Peter does in this first chapter really helps us to understand how to read our Bibles. He, he shows us that there is consistency between what the Old Testament prophets declare and what the New Testament preachers are declaring. They weren't dealing with two different Gospels. They were dealing with one Gospel, the Gospel of Jesus. Did the Old Testament prophets understand it to the degree of those New Testament preachers? No. Christ had not yet come. But those Old Testament prophets were anticipating Christ's coming. And so because of what Christ has done, Peter now says, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Because Jesus has worked in you savingly, because he has redeemed you, he is affecting the way you think towards God, the way your affections are aimed towards God. And he causes you, enables you to have a disposition of fearing him. Now let's, let, let's think about this because this is, this is so critical for us when we think about the Christian life. We've all had those times where we've read commands, we've isolated them, we've read commands and we're just frozen. How am I going to do that? What's God, what's God telling me to do this? He knows I can't do this. But if we'll look at the context, those commands are always couched in the work of Jesus Christ. Because of what Christ has done. Now, Peter says, conduct yourselves in fear, this sense of reverential awe of the Lord God during the time of your stay on earth. We, we could use a couple of terms to help us understand this. Those declarations are the indicatives of scripture. So they're declarations of what God has done in Christ. The commands are the imperatives. Uh, what, what God says, okay, now because of what I've done in your life, now you are to behave in such and such a way. In order to do the commands, we've got to live in the indicatives. In order to do those imperatives, we got to live in the declarations of what God has done for us in Christ. Now, he doesn't make us robots. We still feel very deeply and intensely and act and struggle. And sometimes we disobey and sometimes we fall flat on our face and we repent and we persevere. But we need these gospel reminders and these commands to walk in to bear evidence that we're really following Jesus. You see, we must presume, or we, we must guard against presuming upon the grace of God or treating the Lord casually or giving secondary attention to our spiritual life instead of primary. And so we need this warning. And no, notice how Peter gives us this warning against presumption in redemption. First, he talks about this amazing access we have to the judge. Notice in verse 17, he gives a, a conditional clause. If, if this is true of you, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. Now, he's using this phrase, if you address his father, just as though he were saying, if you are a Christian. Because how do you address the father? Through... The Lord Jesus, through the one who died for you so that you now have access to God. Through Jesus in his death and resurrection, now the way is open. What the writer of Hebrews calls a new and living way. 
And we're able to come into the very presence of God. Now, think about this. We're coming into the presence of God who is the creator and judge of all the creation. He's impartial in his judgment. He doesn't play favorites. Now, we may think, well, you know, I've, I've got a lot of good deeds in my life. I think I'm counterbalancing my bad deeds. That's not the God of the Bible or the teaching of Scripture. That is the teaching of Islam. That is the God of the Quran, Allah. But that's not the God of Holy Scripture. Our God sees all. Nothing is hidden from Him. He searches the hearts and the minds, and He judges justly. And so this clause is reminding us that we are sinners deserving the judgment of God. And yet, look what he says. If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, you call him father because you now know him in mercy and grace through Christ. Because Jesus came to bring you into God's family forever. And so you have access to his throne and he treats you as his children and he loves you and cares for you. And he gladly welcomes you into his father. So if you call him father, then don't presume upon him as judge. But second, there's no contradictions in the divine character. Peter is not asking us to consider God as either father or judge. He's both simultaneously without contradiction. And what that means is that because of God's great mercy, he has judged your sins already if you're a Christian. And he did that in the person of Jesus, who was our substitute before the judgment of God at the cross. Peter uses that kind of substitutionary language in verse 20, that Jesus has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, in your place, on your behalf. And so what, what he's telling us is that if you want to know what the judge thinks about your sins, then look at the cross. And if you want to know what the Father thinks about your sins, again, look at the cross. Because it is only by that cross work with Jesus bearing our sins in his own body on the tree that we can address the Father who impartially judges according to each one's work. So we mustn't think that God has dropped the judge title when he becomes our father. He is the judge who judged us in Christ so that we might call him father. And he must not be trifled with or presumed upon because he is father. And so that leads us to third, a resolute disposition towards God. In light of God as your Father, through Jesus Christ, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Now, when we hear that, that word fear, maybe we think of walking on a trail and there's a snake or um, we're going around a corner and somebody jumps out and says boo or whatever and, and we, we, we have the sudden joke. That's, that's not the implication here because he is our father. Instead, he, he's talking about when we have this deep reverential understanding of God, when we are awestruck by how God has revealed himself to us in Christ and so worked in our lives, when we're serious about our devotedness to him because we realize he is altogether holy and we deserve his judgment, when, when, when we have that kind of fear, then it affects the way we live our lives. I, I was reading in my devotional time this morning out of uh, 1 Peter 4, where Peter says, if it is with difficulty that the righteous man is saved, what will be the outcome of the godless and the sinner? And I thought, I have nothing to boast of before God. It's with difficulty, with difficulty that one now counted righteous in Christ is saved. It only comes by the grace of God. What should that do? That should stir a spirit of reverence before the Lord. Deep, intense respect 
when, when we think about the greatness of his mercy to send his son to redeem us, we begin to hold him in reverence and in awe. You don't treat him like one of the boys or as the proverbial man upstairs or big man as some so tritely and irreverently call this great God. Instead, you feel the weightiness of your sins. You know you deserve the deepest hell, and yet God has shown his great mercy to you in Jesus Christ so that you call him Father. And now you want to conduct yourself, you want to live your life with this deep consciousness of the beauty and glory and majesty and honor of this gracious God. This fear of God, as John Frame put it, is that basic attitude of reverence and awe that inevitably carries with it a desire to do God's will. Fear leads to obedience. Fear, not, not this abject where we're groveling around on the ground, covering our heads, but a fear that is the deepest respect. It is a fear that is birthed out of a love for him and faith in him. We want to do his will. And this is the disposition of one that Jesus has saved. You live with the fear of God. It's no different than what he told the Israelites when they were preparing to enter the promised land. Deuteronomy 8, 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. It's what Solomon repeatedly wrote in Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to everyone. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So that brings us to a question. How do we develop a healthy fear of the Lord? We see this secondly in a reminder of redemption's cost. Now, we've got to see the connection of this command, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. So he's talking about it in this temporal period in which we're living. We, we've got to see the connection to that command to Jesus' saving work. Or else we'll slip into legalism in which we try our hardest to please God and to gain his favor. And we're always feeling under that weight. Or we'll slide into despondency because we feel totally hopeless in fearing God. Or maybe we even rebel and we, we cast, defy, cast aside restraints in rebellion against God. But Peter calls for this fear because first, it is foundational to worship. And you see this throughout the scripture, but just, just an example from Luke's gospel, chapter five and chapter seven. There were people that saw Jesus performing miracles and Luke said they feared him. Do you think that means they were afraid to get near him? They were afraid to listen to him? They were afraid to honor him? No, no, no. He meant they reverenced him. Or another thing, he calls us to fear God because it restrains evil and fleshly indulgence. And again, we see this in a number of places, but one example, 1 Timothy 5.20, a leader who continues in sin is to be publicly rebuked, Paul says, to make the rest of us fearful of sinning. We're, we're to realize there is this gravity to the way we live our lives as those who call ourselves followers of Jesus. A, a third thing that happens in, in fear is that it develops, as Proverbs teaches us, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. How do we walk wisely? How do we, how do we really know what God has spoken? How do we see how that works out into every nook and cranny of our lives? It's the fear of the Lord. And then a fourth thing, it reminds us, fear reminds us that even as Christians, our works will face the judgment of God. So that, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, then remind us in 2 Corinthians 5, we stand before that judgment so that some 
Paul says, will be saved, yet so as by fire. Saved, but no reward. Now, notice three things. First, there's this feudal contrast. Peter moves right from the command to fear the Lord into this vivid contrast with the idolatrous past of his readers. Notice that he says in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, your vain, empty way of life, inherited from your forefathers. So he's saying, stop and think about it. Did all those idolatrous practices take away your sin? Did they free you, redeem you from the hold and grip of Satan and sin and deliver you into the bosom of the Father? No, it's not with perishable things, these vain, empty things that you were set free. Now, we likely didn't grow up with idolatrous shrines around, but perhaps some of us did. But we have our own idols that we get into. Some of those idols are the the treadmill of do, 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 just keep doing this all in an attempt to free us, to redeem us from enslavement to sin. Or we may perform religious rituals thinking that's going to free us. Or we prayed to Mary and the saints. Or we attended shrines and knelt before them. Or prayed the rosary. Or the good Baptist way of doing it, we kept walking down a church aisle thinking that those acts would free us from guilt and judgment. But no, Peter says, That's not our redemption. And so that will not motivate us to conduct ourselves in reverential fear. We see, second, this cost of redemption that's foreshadowed. It seems that the apostle has in mind in uh, in, in verse 18, the Passover, and maybe a number of the other feasts that, that went on and sacrificial days that went on. He says it wasn't several ago that redeemed us, But instead, he says, we were redeemed with precious blood. He says in verse 19, with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, you can almost visualize what he's doing. He's taking that image from the book of Exodus where God warned the people of Israel through Moses that the death angel was getting ready to pass through in the firstborn of every every person or every home. Every animal was going to be slain. Now, they believed it. They had already seen the judgment of God in those nine previous plagues. So when Moses spoke to them, they didn't back off and say, Moses, we're going to argue with you on this point. No, they believed him. And so what were they to do? They were to take the blood of the Passover lamb and sprinkle it on their doorposts, and then this death angel would pass over. And so here's this bleeding of the lamb that's slain and they take it and take a branch of hyssop kind of a, a a bushy little shrub thing and they would dip it in the blood and they would sprinkle it and wipe it on their on the doorpost you think they were okay sarah sarah everything just happy good no they realized something big was going on this death angel was passing through And there was wailing in all the houses of the Egyptians. There was death everywhere except where there was the blood. The Egyptians didn't have that Passover lamb. The blood did not atone. The blood did not cover. But the blood covered for those Israelites. And so Peter takes that picture and he says... There is this greater redemption, this greater deliverance from a greater Passover lamb, this unblemished and spotless lamb of God who is tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. This lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, who takes away the sins of the world, he became our Passover. Paul even uses that language in 1 Corinthians 5 and 10 and And Jesus alludes to it in John 6. He came not to deliver us temporally, but eternally. Not not to free us necessarily from some kind of earthly bondage, but to free us from eternal bondage. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man 
did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so all these shadows from the Old Testament sacrificial system are pointing us to the substance, to the reality in Jesus Christ and his cross where he delivers us by his bloody death for us from the bondage of sin. He redeems us. And so when we cast ourselves upon him, the sin bearer, he sets us free from the bondage of sin and from judgment. And so that helps us to see third redemption accomplished. If you take the, the contrast that Peter gives in verse 18 and 19, if you, if you pull the contrast out and state it positively, Peter says, knowing that you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ. You were redeemed. You were delivered. The, the, the term means you were bought out of the slave market of sin where Satan held you. You were freed from bondage. You were delivered with great price from this infinite slavery. Do we think about the costliness of our salvation? Regularly, daily even. Do we think of how deeply enslaved we are to sin and to Satan and to our own flesh apart from the work of God in Jesus Christ? Peter calls it your futile way of life, your vain, empty way of life. Paul calls it being dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And he goes on to say, we're, uh, we were indulging ourselves into the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were at enmity with God. And he says, we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You see, we were in far more bondage than the Israelites were to the Egyptians. Sin held us with a death grip. Satan had us locked up in his evil, dark kingdom. And our own minds were twisted in rebellion against God. And then God gave grace so that he caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that we might be made partakers in his death and resurrection. Redemption is finished. Jesus says, it is finished. We can't add to what Christ has done. And every time we attempt to do that, we're saying, Jesus, you're not enough. You got to have my help. Isn't that ridiculous to say something like that, to think that, to act in that way? Brother, what we're learning to do is to trust in him, to believe in the satisfaction of his death for us and to live in the resurrection as the promise of an eternal inheritance. Do you know this redeeming work of Jesus personally? Do you know this power of the redemptive work of Christ working in you, having released you from the grip of sin and Satan and freed you to live life in Christ? Then this command, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, doesn't seem nonsensical. It makes perfectly good sense. But notice third, third part of this text, in assurance of redemption's aim. I mean, where is God heading in the redemptive work of Jesus? What, that, that's what Peter is answering in verses 20 and 21. And he's giving us this firm reason and power and enabling to conduct ourselves in reverential fear of God until the day we see Jesus face to face. First, notice this is all according to the divine plan. Now, what, what Peter's doing in this passage, if we have the time to, to work through the, uh, the, the, the rest of chapter 1 and what, what he's already said, he's just hammering home what he's already stated in the early verses of this chapter. He says... In verse 20, for he was foreknown. Some translations have, for he, Jesus, was chosen beforehand. Before the foundation of the world, declaring Jesus' pre-existence in his eternal nature. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared, 
in these last times, and the last times is referring to the first coming of Jesus and the second coming. We're living in the last times. So was Martin Luther in the 16th century. So was Augustine in the 4th century. That's the last times. That's the way the, the Bible's looking at it. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, plural, you, the whole composition of the church, all of the redeemed. In other words, God did not create the world and go into panic mode when Adam and Eve sinned. He'd already planned the work of redemption through Christ. He set apart the Son before the creation who would redeem a people forever. And then it gets very personalized. Jesus appeared for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. He did it for you. Let that sink in. Matter of fact, in the morning when you get up, think of everything you got going on today, let that sink in for the sake of you. For your sake, he did that. And here's the rationale. If God redeemed you at the cost of the bloody death of his son, if he set his son apart before the creation to be your redeemer and laying down his life at the cross, if he did that, all of that on your behalf, for your sake, as he says in this text, then you have all the more reason to fix your hope on future grace, to be holy in all your conduct, to conduct yourselves with reverential fear, and to love one another. The imperatives are rooted in the indicatives. The commands are rooted in the declarations. Live like a Christian, he's saying, because you can if you've been united to God through Christ. Second, he talks about the appropriate response. He said, Jesus appeared for your sake in verse 21, who through him are believers in God. He did this for your sake, and now through Jesus, you are believing in God. Now, the emphasis not on the level of your intellect or your good deeds or your religious fervor, but the emphasis is on through Jesus who died and rose again. Through his redeeming power, you are believers in God. When you finally saw by God's grace the effectiveness of Jesus in his death on the cross for you, you made that appropriate response. You believed in God. And even if this morning the Spirit of God is opening your eyes and you're going, I finally see Jesus died on my behalf, then you're going to respond appropriately. You're going to believe in him. Now, you don't believe the way the demons do. You remember James says you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. But you believe and repent. You believe and follow. You believe and cast yourself wholly upon Jesus Christ. You believe and fear him in love. That brings us to the certainty in Jesus from start to finish. Because this is God's grand aim. That you who through him are believers in God. Verse 21 who raised him, who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that, see the purpose, purpose calls, so that your faith and hope are in God. And what he's doing, he's giving you dispositions. We're to conduct ourselves in fear, yes, reverential all, but another disposition is we're to keep believing him. We're to conduct ourselves in faith. We're to keep hoping in him. We're to conduct ourselves in hope. So our assurance, Peter is saying, is tied to the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. In other words, if God raised Jesus who died for you from the dead, then the same death that is applied to your life to kill sin in your life will also apply the same resurrection of Jesus who was raised from the dead to your life. If you've been united to Christ in, in his death and resurrection, we'll celebrate that in the Lord's Supper. If you've been united with him in that death and resurrection, then that resurrection power is working in you. As he was raised from the dead, so also, here's the promise of God, 
so also will be all those who are in Christ. See, Jesus didn't have a potential death and resurrection. He actually died. He actually rose from the dead. And those who are believers in God through him are also actually united to him in death and resurrection. There's assurance that as Jesus rose from the dead, be assured if you're in him, you will too. And further, just as God gave him glory, referring to the exaltation of Christ, so he will exalt you to live with him forever. So where do you find your assurance? By gazing and meditating on the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus for what he did and what God has done in him, he's now working in you. So our assurance has present and future focus in God. Present in faith. What does faith in God do? Faith just keeps looking to the provision of God. You don't believe him and, and then lay faith aside and say, okay, I've done the faith thing, now everything's up to me. No, you keep believing him. You keep believing the gospel every day. You keep trusting in his promises. That's really the evidence of true faith. You keep believing. Jesus saved us by faith so that our faith might continue to rely upon the grace of God in Jesus' death and resurrection. On the same token, we're also given hope in God for the future. That's what he says in verse 21. Hope is the lodestar, as some of the old writers put it. He's the magnet pull. Hope is the magnet pull of life in Christ now to life in Christ throughout eternity. Hope is leaning into the promises of God. Hope turns the most dismal and hard times into opportunities to anticipate what Jesus has already accomplished coming to fruition in eternity. So what hope does is this homing device looking ahead so that we learn to live each day with an eye on the finality of all that Christ has done coming to fruition in heaven. You see, our whole disposition toward God is changed because in this redemptive act of, act of Jesus, God has united us to Jesus in his death and resurrection. And so we want to fear him, not cringing at him, but feeling the weightiness of knowing such a God who loved us enough to send his son to die in our place. This holy fear affects our obedience because we know he is the judge who welcomes us as, his fa as uh, our father. This fear restrains us from pursuing the indulgence of the flesh for Jesus came to deliver us from bondage to sin. This fear liberates us to worship so for we do not see God as someone we use, but we see him as the one who's poured out his redeeming love to us in Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, conduct yourselves in fear because before long, we will see him face to face. May God give us grace to do that. And if you do not know him, You've been hearing all about Jesus dying in your place. Now cast yourself on him. He is sufficient. Let's pray together.